Business over drinks. Business over drinks. This is Dave and Tom. This is business over drinks. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Business with Drinks. My name is Sterling and I'm calling in from Singapore. Hello everyone, my name is David. I'm calling in from Brisbane, Australia. How are you? Welcome to the show. Not too bad, man. I'm doing well. Uh, it's really, really hot right now in Singapore. So uh, I'm, drink- I'm drinking something really refreshing that I'll share in a little bit. Dave, tell us what's going on with in Brisbane regarding COVID, man. I've heard some really bad stuff. Yeah, there are like 20,000 000- years today not much um it, it's 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 crazy here at the moment you know the, the people are very divided about how they feel about the vaccine how they feel about covid but we won't go into that tonight no no or this is, this, this entire episode is just about anti-vaxxers and stuff like that never mind our guest he can just sit quietly and wait um, <laughs> <laughs> just <different. laughs> all right so um before before we let our guests say anything i just want to give a quick introduction so you know who who's speaking, who's going to be sharing the nuggets of wisdom. We've got Jonathan So on the show today. So uh, John has actually worked in e-commerce and on-demand industries for the last eight years. So not that long, let's be fair. Uh, He's gained experience from companies like, if you're in Asia, you definitely know these companies, Shopee, Gojek, you probably know Standard Chartered. And now he's in his new endeavor, Eskimo. He's a seasoned product manager and entrepreneur. He's also really passionate about the future of work, which is a fancy way of saying HR and things, how things are changing around there. A fintech, uh, specifically in Asia and the creator economy, which is kind of cool. Outside of the office, John actually spends most of the time with his newborn, which is a surprise to me because I didn't think John could have a child, but that's a different story for later. Um, and then he also plays Age of Empires because he's old and he works on various tech products on the side. As you can see, the reason I'm being this mean to John is because I've actually known him for a long time. So that's why I can do this. But also, he's probably not very happy right now. So, John. My long time telling me it's a week. Yeah. <laughs> three, three days. Three days. Hey, John. Welcome hey. to the show, man. Hey, guys. Welcome. Thanks for having Woo. me on board. Thanks for the mini haze. Uh, <laughs> being very, very... Um, being a good boy now, trying not to reply to all that, but I, I will in due time throughout this entire cast. So yeah. you, you just wait, just wait. Yeah, John, John's just going to send me messages the whole time. Hey, I hate you. I hope you die. <laughs> so it's okay. It's okay. You know, I don't it. send messages. I don't need to. You already feel already before. So it's fine. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's true. That's actually very true. No, I'm kidding. Yeah, hey, you so makes me... John, what makes me jealous is how I just realize how young you look, John. You've accomplished so much, right? You, you look really young. Do I look young? Thank God for the Asian face, right? Thank you. That is a compliment. I think we all look young. Just saying, we're all beautiful people here on this podcast. Like self compliments for everyone. So oh, thank you. I don't. I don't think you know. Like yeah, everyone here looks very, very young, given what they've achieved thus far in life. Boom. No, Positivity. then then that's then, how you start then, a podcast. Then, 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 Dave looks. Dave looks about fifty, oh, <laughs> based on the man. how little he's achieved. I Dave, you should to, you you should you should look twelve, mate, based on your achievements. I, I learned how to uh, <laughs> put deodorant on the other day. I had to go to this this film shoot thing. I can't go into details, oh. but uh, they asked me to wear deodorant. I was like, "What's that?" Oh, that was that's really sad. Wait, wait, hold on, hold on. <laughs> you got asked to go to a film shoot thing, and they asked you to wear. Uh, it was a br- like they said, make ah. sure to wear un- underwear and deodorant. Wait, oh, wait, that's so. Oh, we need to talk about that later, man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway, well, maybe, we'll, maybe, maybe, John maybe, tonight. This maybe, about John. maybe privately. Maybe we need to talk about that privately, man. <laughs> Especially since that was specific. I don't think that was part of any sort of instructions, John. I think that was just specific for Dave. Where no, under I don't know. I do, <laughs> I do leave notes for myself sometimes to actually remind myself to wear underwear for a day. So that is. I, that's normal. That's that's, that's, quite that's business. This business advice right there, everyone. That's business advice, and that is general and life advice, right? Just leave those open reminders around the house for you. Oh man, I don't uh, wearing underwear is overrated, dude. But hold on, before See, we, you need to be a reminder. Before we go, before we go down this extremely, extremely <laughs> long path, right? <laughs> I think I think we need to we need to jump into the questions. Oh, uh, but before that, right? Uh, why don't Why doesn't everyone introduce what they're drinking? Dave, why don't you tell us what you're drinking, man? Yeah, so tonight I'm drinking a Cabernet Merlot reserved by Wine of Australia. There oh. you go. It's, it's not bad. It's by, sorry, by Sands Perial Estate, 2019. And I'm drinking it warm, which is, uh, which is not good. Yep. It needs to be drunk at around 16 degrees. 
Hey, John, uh, why don't you tell us what you're drinking, man? I have a dirty Coke. That's all I've got. So I've run out of alcohol in my fridge. I've run out of beers because we just eat everything now and I haven't had time to go grocery shopping. So I do have just a dirty Coke because that's all I have left as a beverage in my fridge besides cold water, which I do have here as well as a top up. Oh, lovely. That, I mean... It's sad, but I'm just saying love it because we're on a we're on a podcast. <laughs> um, so I'm drinking a Vino Verde, so white wine from Portugal. It is I'm not going to pretend I know the name, but we'll put it in the show notes. It's a very light wine. Uh, it's quite easy to drink. I don't think I can get drunk on this because it's only nine point five percent. But I used it for cooking recently, and it, it's quite a decent wine to just have on a rather warm evening. You probably oh, drink the whole bottle then. Probably, man. I'm going to try not to because I've got things to do later. So I've got I've got people to sh- shout at and stuff like that. So uh, we're going to just go stram- jump straight into it, man. Hey, John, thanks a lot for coming on. And before we get into the questions where we actually ask you uh, things about work and everything, man, like congrats on congrats on your on your baby. What's it like being a Thank new you. father? Yeah, I mean, it's a big lifestyle change. You're taking care of uh, another smaller human being. And it's not really, I guess, like uh, something that anyone fully, fully prepared for. I mean, you can read up on it. You can see all these YouTube videos about parenthood and fatherhood. But ultimately, I mean, you just got to really be in the moment, I guess, like uh, when it happens. And so baby's now five months, five months and a bit. Big lifestyle is really not too much, I guess. Uh, You know, didn't really sleep as much anyway beforehand. So it's still the same. Uh, baby wakes up every four to five hours. I wake up every four to five hours just for my existential crises. So, you know, nothing's changed in that end. Um, and yeah, I guess like the other big change or what it's like really being a new father is for me, it feels like the wiring in my brain's changed a little bit. Uh, you wouldn't need to worry, right? Before being a parent, like even if you were, say, married or you had your boyfriend, girlfriend, your partner you want to go somewhere, you want to fly somewhere, even with COVID, it's like you can bear, you know, through that pain, right? 14 day quarantine, whatever, all that jazz with each different countries like regulations. But now with the child in tow, you can't really do the same because you can't leave and then, oh, I'm going to get stuck with my infant kid for three weeks or two weeks, like in a hotel room, like you go insane, right? Like it's really difficult to manage things like that. So I think you're wiring then and rather you the way that you perceive the way that you take risks and everything like that changes. So there is a change, I guess, in that aspect, you always got to make sure that you take care of another kid, but in a way, I think it's not really also too different from my work because when I start things up, it's really, it's really that, right. You're taking care of business in its infancy. Every little thing matters all the time you spend on a business matters. And it's the same thing with a kid, right? The more time you spend with the kid when they're younger, the more secure they are, the more safe they feel they are with you, the more familiar they are, so on and so forth. Like that matters, right? And the investment you make early days actually matter quite a bit. It's the same with the startup. The investments that you make to do it well and do it right in the early days go a long way when they grow up and become, you know, I don't know, huge hulking monsters I'm not speaking for my child i don't know what he's going to turn out to be like he could be a huge hulking monster who knows so yeah that's i guess like uh, you know some lifestyle and changes in my life thus far um you guys expecting kids anytime soon <laughs> dave already got he's got a ton of kids around the world man he just goes around yeah. and spreads his seeds <laughs> yeah. This, yeah so i don't know yet but this what we're talking says about my work ethic I'm always working. So <laughs> I, I, what, what worries me about having a kid is... Sorry, Dave, but, but that was the best joke you've ever said. Sorry, Karen. Karen. Apologies. Karen. What worries me about uh, a kid is that uh, I'll neglect it, right? I'll, like, I'll, I'll just, right. just completely forget it exists. How, how, have you found your... Well, people have told me they've actually become more productive once they've had kids. Like, how... how in terms of a business running your business yeah running deskimo and all of your other projects and yeah. having a kid so. uh i would say it's it's basically you've only got 24 hours in a day right and you can only fill up like your different uh, the many different cups of your life right in a day 
So you can either spend more time going to the gym if you want to focus on your physical fitness, mental wellness or learning. If you want to do a lot of learning on the side, uh, then you've got your job, you've got family, social, all sorts, right? So, you know, you got to have like the cups you kind of want to focus on and you want to fill up your cups, right? Like accordingly. And me, it's always a question of, I can't, I only have 24 hours. I can only have so much that I can fill up, right? Uh, it's a trade-off then. Like, where do you want to spend most of your time? And I guess right now, one of the things that I've traded off is more on the physical fitness side of things. Like I haven't been able to go to gym, run and all that so as much. Uh, because I prefer to take that time that I used to go to the gym, all that, spend it with the kid instead. And for me, I think that investment in will pay off in the longer term. Um, I can probably, you know, suffer through not going to for a short while, right? At least until the kid grows up, until he's maybe a year or two old, and he's a little bit more stable. Right now, as an infant, it's just trade off, right, with your time um, during the day. So, yeah, I guess like that would like, you know, like what the changes are really like. Hope that answers your question. I think um, yeah. when he becomes sense. Hulk, like when he becomes jacked, he can bring you to the gym. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's when you start integrating, right? Like when they mature and when they get older, and this is the dream, this is my fingers being crossed. You know, you take them to go hiking, they get some new hobbies, you get to share those hobbies with them. And that's when your bonds grow, right? But as a kid, it's really, you know, they're, um, they're pretty useless. <laughs> that way they can't do anything they can't be themselves they can't even hold on to you right you got to hold on to them all the time and carry them so until they're a bit more self-sufficient that's when i think things start getting easier and i would imagine like it's just spending time and integrating sort of that life with your kid mm -hmm. with your other aspects of your life right be it fitness be it work be it like you know social and with family so i don't see them as too mutual in a way i see them as just with each other this whole work-life balance thing is why i think it's always been a big conversation topic and this the same thing right with um companies themselves always taking over people's lives and people feeling that they are you know obligated to work in china they've got this whole 996 thing going on yeah and that's they can't crazy. do anything right and what's I, 996 so 996 is this thing where in china it originated from china and alibaba where they would work 9 a.m to 9 p.m six days a week hence 996 there's a there's a better term for it in chinese i, I just can't remember it so oh, okay. but that's essentially it right like you would work 9 a.m to 9 p.m six days a week and sure you get sundays off but you basically don't have any time to socialize to do anything else um I don't foresee myself ever doing that because now being in charge of my own business, it's a lot easier for me to manage my time um, and allocate, right? How much effort I want to put in to the business and to my kid. Um, I think that's the beauty of owning your own business or really having your own time to manage rather than having someone else manage your, for you. like if you were in a bigger corporate that's essentially, I think, what a lot of people find themselves in, right? Like people or, you know, your bosses and your boss's bosses, I need X done, get it done in Y time, do it now or whatever, right? And that's, you know, you don't have a choice if you want to keep your high paying job. So, yeah, I guess that's, uh, you know, paid off you have with the startup. You do, you do lose a little bit of that, um, you know, security in that sense. So you take a lot of risk being in a startup. But the benefit here as well is that, oh, and, uh, and I take a much more reduced like salary, but the benefit is that I get to trade that off with, I get to spend my time however I want. Um, and I can then now also allocate more of my time with my kid, even though I earn significantly less than compared to when I was say with Stan Chart beforehand. I think Tang and I can relate to that. We were talking about how partners significantly more than we do. Yep, oh, I have, I have huh? no money, so it's cool. Uh, <laughs> got no, nothing man. to lose guys got nothing to lose <laughs> that's what i'm gonna tell myself well, when i go on a killing spree man <laughs> uh that's, that's gonna be that's gonna be my recorded be my <laughs> this is also <laughs> evidence now yeah, this is okay. all, that's, yeah, that's, okay. that's, and you have two, be... uh, two witnesses as well <laughs> <laughs> yeah they're, they're gonna say in the bank like what's he muttering this i'm like got nothing to lose uh no no that's that's a joke and i would never do that because i do have a lot of stuff to lose and i love myself too much but um, yeah, man, so no, that's, that's interesting, right? Because you actually kind of mentioned there's a bit of a trade-off there. So 
maybe you can tell like because one thing we've always wanted to ask and at least i wanted to ask was like how are the experiences different from working in companies you know like shopee godrick and then you started your own thing as well right and then now yeah. you're helming decimal like how yeah. how is it different how are the how are the experiences different like like yeah, yeah. what's different about it uh i mean all the different so uh at shopee we started from ground zero the difference in the business setting was that Shopee was technically under Garena back then yep. under C Group, right? It's now called C Group. So in a way, uh, when we started Shopee, we were really ground zero. Um, most startups have that zero to one phase where they're conceptualizing with their testing the market, MVP, and then scaling really quickly. Um, in Shopee, we basically did that, but we scaled really, really fast with the king of Garena. Um, so there was good funding back then, and we didn't need to worry about raising rounds and all that because all the funding for Shopee to scale was all managed internally under Garena. So what, basically for all the people who gamed under Garena or under C Group now, in all across like APAC uh, or Southeast Asia specifically, uh, all that revenue went over to Shopee. So sorry, guys, like um, it would be a cash cow, I think, for Garena, but they wanted to expand, right? In any case, I think what then is that you know we when we started didn't have an app no logo hardly could even agree on the name like at the start when we were like why call it shopee it has p in the name like why would you name something with p in it right like but then you know i guess like uh that's that's all just history right now it's a monster it's like the number one e-commerce marketplace here um, southeast Asia. just a quick ad break everyone you know everyone loves books right and if you don't love books you ought to be deported. So now, thanks to Audible, you can listen to an audio book absolutely free. Who doesn't like free stuff? Sometimes I don't, but typically I like free stuff. All you have to do to claim your free audio book is go to businessoverdrinks.com forward slash books. For all those people that don't like free stuff, now I understand why some of y'all didn't sign up for the free uh, website audit and the free PR audit that we offered, but that's fair enough. All right, so just going back to the uh, the free book from Audible. So in this page, we've actually compiled a bunch of some of the our favorite books and audiobooks that have kind of shaped our lives for better or worse. That's why Audible is my favorite thing because I can't read. I'm basically illiterate. Um, we're also there's so nothing wrong with that. Oh, oh there, there is, is, but it's there's 100 stuff wrong with that. There's a real lot of stuff wrong with that. <laughs> so, right? We'll be we'll be listing. Uh, we'll be including some of the books that are. Uh, Guests I recommend as well because we have some really great guests who actually read stuff that added value to their lives versus the stuff that we read, which just lets us pass time and and helps us forget about the sadness that is our lives. <laughs> Dave, so you want to tell people how to do it? Are you drunk again, Tony? All right, bit, so man. all you need to do to see these audio book recommendations, and we've included some physical book recommendations in there too, is go to businessoverdrinks.com forward slash books. What was your role in Shopee, by the way? Oh, yeah. So I originally did BD, so business development. It was a lot of sales. Uh, Shopee is a two-sided marketplace. Uh, It's basically matching all the different sellers across everywhere, right? From cross-border sellers down to your local, down to your brands that with users so if you think amazon in the early days it was like that but we were mobile for uh, mobile focused first um and yeah i mean the main competitor back then was lazada and lazada was browser based uh so they were primarily on computers you're on laptops they didn't go mobile first whereas we went mobile first um and so yeah now the biggest marketplace i did the I did sales, I did marketing, ops data product. I touched basically almost every aspect of the business, um, trying to scale it in Singapore, Malaysia, and then in a regional capacity, eventually coming back to Singapore because I wanted to tackle more complicated problems. Um, I could go into the whole strategy and whatnot of it, but that's a whole other story. But yeah, essentially touched almost every aspect when I was in Shopee. But going zero to one with a very well-funded startup uh, was I think, one of the most intense experiences I could ever have because you don't have to then worry about funding, right? You're just worrying about executing, executing fast and just outperforming competitors. Whenever they come up with a feature, we, we will either need to come up first or come up with the same feature at the same time. 
and you know keep scaling right like um to either vouchers subsidies whatever it is every month every week your you know growth in terms of users in terms of gmv revenue just have to keep going up there is no sideways there is no going down you have no choice but to go up um, and we were pressured as such as well, right? Like the intensity from upper management was always to perform. Like we're giving you all this money. Why are you not providing us like the return? Uh, you don't even need to worry about funding, you know, like just take the money, grow it, care, get me those users, get me that GMP. And so, yeah, we did that, yes. right? And that was, that was intense, but that was good in Shopee. Uh, a lot of learning, especially in Southeast Asia, how fragmented Southeast Asia is. Um, how different it is to tackle each market. So yeah, did that for nearly four years uh, before moving on to Gojek for uh, a couple of years as well. Uh, I wanted to get out of the rigmarole of Shopee and the intensity in a way and take a step back, work in e-commerce and on-demand again, which is what Gojek was about, um, for GoFood specifically, um, and a different type of startup. Shopee was very intense. They still are intense. Um, they also subscribe, and they won't say this publicly, but they have they would subscribe pretty much close to that 996 lifestyle. People are on all the time. They freaking have campaigns going live in midnight. So I definitely know staff who are still working right up to midnight when the campaign goes live and waiting up to midnight, launching, and then at least for the next maybe hour after that, just observing, making sure that nothing breaks. You know, now they have what? One, one, two, two, three, three, all these crazy. Oh, yeah, every single month. Started with every Singles month. Day, by the way, which yeah. was really, it was a pain in the butt. It, yeah. it bugs me, and I don't even work in e commerce. <laughs> so, 11 11 was the Alibaba concoction, um, and then ended up being like 12 12. So, Laura jumped on that days, and now it's just let's do one, one, two, two, let's do it once a month and even more. So, eventually, those things will phase out. But, you know, ultimately, people, they, they need to grow. And that was one of the levers of growth. Right? It's just how can I keep my campaigns as intense as possible so I keep as many eyeballs into the marketplace as possible. But anyway, I wanted to escape a little bit of that, work a little bit more strategically and with product and project and go food estates overseas in Vietnam and Thailand. I mean, that's what I did, right? For the first year when I was in Gojek before being repositioned to be, going, uh, to be back in Indo, um, slightly different take on that, I guess, with Gojek. It was very on demand and it was different in a sense where it's not e commerce, but uh, sorry, it's not like a traditional commerce marketplace, but it was an on demand marketplace. So people wanted food, for example, and they needed it in the next 20 minutes. Um, a lot of more logistical problems, a very, very different business model in a sense. But it gave me a really good opportunity to sort of take a step back and understand and reprioritize, right? Like business doesn't have to be like in Shopee, um, like I don't have to work, yeah, like an insane amount all the time just to produce results for people up above, right? Like who basically most of the rewards with the stock price. So yeah, then after that and after taking a step back, went to stand chart for a while. I would classify that as a little bit of a mistake on my side because originally I wanted to do work at stand chart because I thought, okay, one paid me better. Two, it would offer me a better life in terms of like the amount of time I could spend in terms of what my balance. But I realized it very quickly it wasn't for me because one, there was a lot of red tape to get through, to get anything mm -hmm. done. <clears throat> and I didn't want to also, um, I guess, deal with the politics involved in any of these, uh, in, in a large company like that. Like there were a lot of things that went on that, you know, I can't say, but it was just, yeah, not really the best me to be in especially with the startup mentality um, it's one thing when a company says i want to start up or i want to imbue, uh, imbue everyone with a startup like mentality but it's another thing for them to be able to execute or at least get past any of their regulatory or internal like compliance measures all that red tape to actually be like a startup and execute like one so you know i realized very quickly that okay not for me and so pull the plug after about six months in and most people were telling me, oh, yeah, stay for a year, stay for two years, move on. And I was like, why? Like, wasting my time, right? Wasting my life doing it. And it's more painful for the company as well because they know I'm not enjoying it. So pull the plug, 
after about six months to start my own thing. And now I'm doing Deskimo, starting from zero to one again, which is great. And I feel much more myself. I feel happier. I govern my time a lot better. And I feel very productive starting something up again from scratch. Um, so yeah, that's that's me in a nutshell in terms of career and what I've done. Sorry, I went on with, with that. That's all right, man. I think that was, that was really insightful. Uh, I think it's really interesting to look at people's journeys because I think the lessons that you learn, the mistakes that you made as well, right? that's the really mm. cool part. Because I, I kind of don't like it when um, there are interviews and people just talk about successes because successes are great, but they're really few and far in between, right? Majority of what you see, yeah. what you face are failures. And then that's what, when the, that's what makes a success a lot more sweeter. Right. So Dave, uh, success yeah. is when you actually, something actually happens the way you want it to happen and you get a benefit. It's what we should aspire to. But oh, it's like when, when people laughed at your joke that day years ago. Oh, yeah. oh here we go. Here we go. <laughs> here we go. Just, this, Dave, Dave takes a little bit of time, but he's just going to come and say really hurtful things. <laughs> he says all the hurtful things before we press record most of the time. And then when he's on the yeah. podcast, he's like, oh, why are you being so mean? I, I hit time with a the, with a yellow page, so he bru- he doesn't bruise. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He just he, he puts his soap bars in a in a sock or a pillowcase and just like beats me with it. Uh, that's well, usually yeah, a business style. Spare time, but I guess it's <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> So you guys um, stay your friends or? Uh... <laughs> Friends anyway, friends. <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's a really strong word. Yeah, it's strong really word, strong, man. like acquaintance, people that we know, <laughs> like we know each other. <laughs> um, but speaking of work-life balance, I think everyone, yeah. that's a big thing, you know, and then he comes a great resignation, you know, that people have yeah. experienced some pretty traumatic stuff during COVID and, 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 and we're still expecting people to work really hard right now, now, yeah. now that we have the, the great resignation what's your take on what's what's your take yeah. on um the great resignation i, I mean it's happening i don't frame it as really like the great resignation uh, i think people are resigning for sure but people are also finding other jobs right <clears throat> ultimately it's going to be just a big reaction of what are you doing physically that don't want to do anymore right like that you were just stuck with um, there's, you know, YouTube videos, there's talks on a lot of this, but a lot of the times people get stuck in the machinations of a business and they're just clicking buttons at the end of the day. And it's like, why do I need to be in an office clicking buttons or why can you not automate that, right? I think given COVID, uh, I think COVID is a great accelerator. It's accelerating everyone towards automation. Um, you know, everything from creating and making robots in the kitchen all the way down to like, um, you know, automating scripts uh, to, you know, automate your clicks or automate like your CRM or whatever it is that you need to do to get your business running functionally without needing someone to manually do it. So, you know, it's given us that opportunity for businesses to real and it's given people the time to actually think about what do you really want to do in your life, right? Do you want to sit here in front of a laptop clicking buttons all the time? And so, then what happens is once they realize and have this time at home to really reflect, they start figuring out, I don't want to do this. Like I can figure this out myself or I can do something else better. And I think for a lot of people, they then end up resigning or they end up going to a different job. They either go sideways or they go upwards um, depending on their capability. Because right now with the whole great resignation thing, I think it might be a primarily US thing. Um, I don't think we talk about it as much in Asia because developing countries and there's a whole, you know, we can go hours into this about like labor and it's allocated around Asia, Southeast Asia, even Singapore. But I think the gist is that it will happen in Asia. Um, It probably will be to a lesser extent, I'd say, um, as we move more towards automation and as people find that, you know, hey, I don't want to end up doing something where... I'm stuck, yeah, doing something really monotonous. Like, why am I not working for myself, or why am I not creating value uh, in another, in, in a better way than in my current position, and getting paid better for it? Um, this is sort of where I want to work a little bit more on and endeavor and, and discover, right? Because I see this great reshuffling, this great reallocation, 
impacting things like real estate, impacting things like software, impacting things like, yeah, people work. Um, because, you know, and, and startups are the ones adopting a lot of this with flexibility, uh, with their work arrangements. Um, some of the big tech companies as well, of course, you see SAP, LinkedIn, and whatnot doing the same thing. But ultimately, like the older businesses say like, and this is the trope in Singapore, SME bosses, um, they just want their staff to be there, work until 9 p.m. Oh, yeah. all the time so they can yeah. manage them, watch them, and that's how they feel good and feel better. But I think if you dig deeper into why that's the case, is it because it's that they do want to see their staff work and that's how they feel productive? Or is it because they themselves aren't generating enough value by doing that, they feel like they're generating value? So, you know, in a way, it's going to make people rethink why do I need to manage and managing these people when they can either semi-autonomously work or I can automate their jobs? Um, so yeah, it's going to make a lot of people think it's going to get business owners thinking about how they want to manage their businesses. Um, as we approach this whole great resignation or great reallocation, um, there's different aspects to talk about real estate, people, time, three, four hour, work, it's like four day work week that some countries are experimenting with. Um, you know, I think all of this is going to happen in the next couple of years and that will be the new normal. I think gone are the days as well of going to the office nine to five, Monday to Friday. Like that's not going to happen. Small SMEs, maybe, maybe they force their staff to do it, but that's when they're going to have churn. That's when their staff will just resign and just go work with either a bigger company that has more flexible work policies or yeah, they just straight up resign and just, I don't care. I don't need a job right now. I'll take unemployment for a bit and figure out like the next move because I'm not coming in five days a week. None of my friend circles are doing it. Um, and, you know, like why make that sacrifice? Why pay money for transportation to work? Mm. You paying for me to occupy a desk that I'm not going to be there 80% of the time or I don't want to be there 80% of the time. I can be productive at work. Why don't you save money? So help me save money from, you know, transport to work, save time and just give me an eight hour work day at home. Right. And I don't know why people are so hesitant on it. Right. It just makes numerical sense and business sense to be able to do that. The only thing is it's a cultural thing, but it's also a thing, I guess, like trust, right. With your employees and productivity. I think, and deeper into that thread as well, it will make managers rethink what they mean by KPIs and what they mean by making sure that teams are productive. Because then the question becomes, if my team members can be productive on their own, why do I need a manager to be there? And then the whole, you know, managers need to rethink, right? Why are they really there? And that's probably what people fear. And that's probably why they demand people to come back in because they need to feel useful. So yeah, that's, the, I don't the, know. The biggest, the biggest segment of the workforce that has been impacted actually hasn't been the, the lower level or the, the execution stuff. It's actually been middle management because they're exactly. they struggling to manage people without putting barriers in their way, right? Yeah. Because when you leave, because if you just, if you look, you had to manage output, you got to be able to uh, manage creativity. There's a lot of skill involved. Versus mm -hmm. something that's very process driven that you can just kind of force people to fit into a process, which you can't do very well in a hybrid or a kind of like a remote situation. It's quite difficult. Yeah. So there's and a lot of struggle there. There's a lot of struggle, right? And that's why I believe in this whole new aspect of like the creator. And I think right now the, the, the connection between the creator economy is always like with crypto and all that and decentralized currencies. But ultimately when you, talk about and think about creators. You guys are creators. You guys are yeah. podcast builders. You guys have your own publications. You guys have your own businesses. You have your own Instagrams that you're trying to get your brand, get your name out there and potentially monetize eventually and build a living for yourself, doing what you like, right? And people will find time to do that. And if they find that that's a viable alternative where I can actually make a decent income from, like Screw work, right? Screw working for like this big MNC that's going to make me come to work and, you know, days a week or whatever and all that, right? So give me my flexibility. Give me my flexibility for me to be me 
and sure, I'll be happy to work for you. So that dynamic is shifting, right? We're not being herded into factories anymore. We're not being herded into, you know, the whole concept of Fordism, the nine to five work day was because people worked in factories, right? They need to produce cars, they need to produce more Fords, da, da, da. I translated then to the office. Doesn't make sense anymore, right? You don't need to be in the office and you can be decentralized. As long as you have a laptop, you've got a webcam, you don't even need a webcam, all laptops, most, have, most of them have webcams, internet, done. And so I see a really big shift happening. If, it, if people don't shift now, like they're just gonna be left behind. They're gonna have like very few employees or retention is just gonna be an issue. People who set up their own business, their own startups, they'll get the crop because they offer flexibility, even at a same or even lower paycheck. People just do cherish that, right? Like I think having that time. So it's really interesting yeah. you say that. I was I was having dinner with two dinner and drinks with two really close friends, and they they're in senior levels of of, of companies. Mm hate it they absolutely hate it and, yeah. and why wouldn't you like if you go on youtube now people talk about how they're making a thousand dollars a day yeah. there's a woman we want to get a podcast she sells farts in a job and how much there did you she go. make <laughs> have you heard of her she's yeah. she, she calls herself a fartpreneur so <laughs> yeah i saw that i think she was on was it no i can't remember which one like not 90 day fiance or whatever but she got famous off that Oh yeah, she got um, famous off. She got famous off some sort show. of reality TV show. I forget. Yeah, one. yeah. And then so now she can make a living selling her farts. Since she got hospitalized for it, she. Yeah, for she trying did. to push out a fart too hard, and then basically, she thought she had a heart attack. Yeah, basically overwork in a way, right? Yeah. Well, like that's by good. Too much. Man, at least she's she's legit. She's not pretending to fart. She actually yeah. is farting. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Integrity. It's real product. Something I don't, man, I, I don't know, man. We were talking about her recent NFT. Dave and I were talking about recent NFT. And there are sometimes I feel we go too far. Because right? <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> hey, let's pull back a little bit. Let's go back to the norm for a little bit. So that when you're selling a fart as NFT, I draw the line there. <laughs> then we'll go back to something. Then we can talk about that later. <laughs> Unless she makes a shitload of money. then you'll Yeah, be no, like, no. I'm not oh, saying that she won't. I have a feeling she will make money off that. What I'm saying is, it's not right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, pure be a pure capitalist, right? Like let the markets decide. Right? And while yeah. you're doing that, make some money. That's all. I mean, so, NFT is being super speculative. Be interesting, but yeah. That's what I'm so going to get all the fans, man. All the fans. Speaking of, you know, all this, how then would you approach hiring people or how do you approach hiring people and managing people? Yeah. So I think in that sense, like there are a lot of things to discover what people want right now. If you look at the mentality and I've talked to interns, I've talked to like students, fresh grads about this. If you think about the, the, where they're coming from right now, they've just been two, two years of COVID, right? After or during uni and they're used to being, you know, um, virtual. They're okay coming into the, to come to the office they would love to meet people, but they're okay being virtual. Again, the anecdotal from my own experience, like speaking to, um, you know, like the interns that I've interviewed and fresh grads, um, but they're okay being virtual. In fact, some of them really cherish their time being virtual because they get to spend more time at home. Um, at the same time, I think if you look at the different um, needs, when I talk to fresh grads, one of their biggest needs, is not just, I want to have that flexibility, but it's just, I want to be in an office because as a fresh grad, you learn the most from people in and around your vicinity. Like when you have your colleagues in the same boat suffering from the same pressure, you know, everyone suffers together kind of thing. Like you, you, you have that esprit de corps, you have that camaraderie, right? Like suffering under one tyrannical boss. Um, and that's when people form their social bonds. That's when, you know, they friendships, right? Amongst hardship. Um, that is one aspect I think that the next generation may actually have less off. I don't think they'll miss out on it completely because companies are still trying to facilitate people working with each other together. Um, but I think gone were those tense times where you'd stay maybe in the office up to midnight with your, you know, running the campaign for, you know, a midnight thing that goes live at 12 or 1 a.m. Um, you'll do this virtually now. So you, I guess, suffer alone. <laughs> So that's why there's also a huge resurgence, right, in terms of mental health um, and wellness, because 
you don't want to suffer alone. That is the worst thing for, if, imagine if you're a fresh grad, right? Like you're trying to learn as much as you can going out into the working world and you don't have anyone to suffer with. So, you know, we see that as like a big thing that I say a lot of fresh grads or a lot of like, um, you know, interns and all, they cherish. They want to have everything. It's up to us to be able to figure out like what is really most important for them. Uh, we revert back to the norm. I don't think that's really possible, even though some may ask for it. Um, but we can't really go fully virtual either because then they would, yeah, they would find it tough, right? Trying to adjust and trying to actually grow into their roles and learn. So for me, I think the biggest thing when I'm hiring is always, what do you want in terms of flexibility? Be very clear with what their outputs should be. I think hiring for hiring's sake can happen, right? It happens with a lot of big MNCs, but as a startup, you've got to be really, got to be very clear about what they're going to be producing and what they're going to be doing. And as long as they can do that, great. And then after that, the question will be, how do I help you achieve all of that X, Y, and Z? Be it revenue, be it new clients, be it user interviews. And then they'll come up and they'll say, okay, I need like, you know, need like a webcam, I need some physical stuff. Um, and, or I want flexibility, I want to be able to travel. Like I need to be able to have a budget for that. Um, or I need, you know, I need some, yeah, it's, I just need some health, uh, like, sorry, I just need some health benefits. Something like if you could get me some coaching or whatever it is, right? Uh, as well, that's always nice. Gym perks, all this usual stuff, right? To keep people happy. And so, listening to your employees and especially the young generation that comes up now, I think it's very, very important uh, because it's not the same. You can't apply the same formula for fresh grads, say, two years ago. So, wait, wait, I've got actually, I've got a question for you, John. And yeah. I, I think this is something that. We might have to cut this out, Dave. So you you might want to check the time at which I'm asking this question. Um, so you mentioned right that fresh grads, like if especially working remote or hybrid, mm. you know they they require mm. equipment. So like you know like a really nice webcam that we have, or like a mic and a few other things, right? What if you were to use those that equipment that your company spent? Let's be very fair. You could spend actually about a couple of thousand easily. Yeah. Yeah. Webcam, you know, gym membership, something like that. Sure. Uh, a couple of thousand usually per employee, right? And they started, I'm going to, I know, I want to say something else, but let's pretend they started a Patreon account, right? Right, right. So, and it was not a Patreon account, it's something else. And then you're just <laughs> using it, using it to sure. like supplement the income. So they're still working for you. Like they're, they're, yeah. they're obviously very productive. They're quite good, but they're yep. using your, the things you paid for. So yep. supplement the income with something else, you know, being sure. creative in a different sense. Or even using yeah. the computer, like you give them a MacBook. Yeah, you give them a laptop, yeah. your, Mac, your yeah. MacBook, yeah. something, right? How yeah. would, like, what how, What would be your recommendation on how to deal with that? And secondly, how do you feel about that personally? I feel that comes from a very deep place, Terry. But yeah. Um... <laughs> yeah, and I'm just thinking, how far could I have gone as an employee? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> like, this I would have gone all the way. I would have gone all the way. Like, <laughs> Um, I guess in that sense, it really, for me, my own perspective, right? It doesn't matter as long as you're producing for the company. Like you can use the tools that I give you, be it like your uh, gym membership, health wellness stuff. Like, I think that's fine. Don't abuse any of the tools. Don't ask for more things that can't really provide. But as long as you produce what I, you know, I'm very clear with you about, I think that's important, right? If you achieve in say, for example, like an X number of dollars revenue in your KPI, go go ham, right? I don't care. If you can do that in one day of the year instead of the 22 days in a month, sorry, not one day in the year, but one day in a month instead of the 22 days in a month, go ahead, right? Like, I don't care as long as you can produce this for the business. Um, sure, there is some aspect for me that also says like, okay, if this person can do it in one day, imagine what he can do with 22 days of full maximized blah, blah, blah. But you know, if you think about it, then you're just planning for like disaster because you're relying so much on that one proof, right? You all video um, or whatever KPI that you've got, right? Because he's a superstar. So it's not sustainable as a manager, right? To think about it that way. The old way of thinking, I think is always like, you know, how can I squeeze my employees as much as possible for as much value as possible? But now it's not really the case, right? It's just how do I create something more sustainable for my employees to achieve. And that doesn't overburden them, right? While still giving them a ramp to learn. 
um, and achieve and stay longer with the company. Because you know, once the employee figures that they're the main um, revenue driver for your company, what if they leave? Then if they know, right? Like, and they're being and they're being empowered now to do it as well with the whole anti-work or great resignation thing. Like, do you want to be caught out and put in that position? You shouldn't. You should be hedging your bets, um, betting on multiple employees providing you that X number of revenue. Um, so you're not so reliant on one, right? And not screwed when that person leaves. And I think that's where a lot of like, you know, thinking has to change, right? Just more for sustainability for both the employee and for the business themselves. But that requires a lot of planning. And that's what probably a lot of managers are afraid of because beforehand I squeeze employees by them being there all the time, push, 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 push. But they need to now start thinking, start planning deeper and more thoroughly about, yeah, just building more sustainable KPIs for employees and assisting them to make sure that, you know, they're learning, they're growing, and they're achieving what they need to achieve. Okay, so everyone work for John. John. <laughs> sounds like a... Yeah, you can start your OnlyFans account. John won't give a shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. he'll, he'll, free, right? he'll help. He'll help fund it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Inadvertent, like, not directly. It? Not directly. I will <laughs> supply you with the materials if you need. And if you find fulfillment that way, as long as you keep producing for the business, I'm happy, right? Like, your job yeah. as an employer... John's going to buy, like, five family. subscriptions. John's going to buy five. He's going to buy. He's like, oh, here, here we go. My fried credit cards. Well... Merry Christmas. <laughs> Merry Christmas, indeed. All um, right. Sorry, I, I realized I went on for quite a bit. I'm okay as well to go further, like, in terms of timing. So, like, it's, yeah, your choice. Like, how you want to go ahead. Yeah, no, no worries. Yeah. No worries, man. I think we got a little bit of time. Dave, you okay? Yeah, and you're happy to keep that segment in turn? It's a pretty good one. Yeah, yeah, I'm good. Okay, cool. I, like, as long as you're not too sensitive about that uh, and you don't mind being associated with all the fans and just, uh, you know, supplementing the, uh, <laughs> the, the, the creator industry, it's no, cool. wrong with that. I think the creator economy will definitely grow. Like, it's yeah. where we're all headed to, right? As work decentralizes and people find fulfillment outside of mm. the sure, and I think. Only fans is a better revenue than pornography, like working in the yeah. porn industry. Oh yeah, you know for right? sure, for yeah. sure. Like when yeah. when I do when I do this, it's uh, I'm actually mocking the only fans creators that kind of just do bullshit. They put like the same pictures that they put <laughs> on Instagram. They put it on only fans and they charge people. Not a fan of that. Go all go go all in on nothing. <laughs> That's, okay, you didn't know before, but man. I'm sorry. Sorry to hear that's that. experience talking right there. <laughs> yeah, yeah um, I, I hate spending money for no reason, man. <laughs> <laughs> so you you made you know Deskimo, you guys made headlines recently for, for the, the capital raising you did, three million. Yeah. I mean, that's a pretty decent feat. And and yeah. why combinator wasn't you know that that's a brand in itself. How what was that like? Congrats on that, by the way. Yeah, thank you. And I think I mean, Ycom has been great so far. It is very different compared to, I guess, some accelerators that are born and bred here or originated, say, in Singapore. Um, I think a lot of it was, I mean, everything was virtual. Like, there was just no travel to San Fran or anything, right? I think yeah. previous batches would have done that, uh, but everything is virtual. So you wake up at, you know, 3, 4 a.m. ungodly times of the night just to attend these calls and learnings. Ultimately, my big takeaway from a lot of it is also that besides the classroom participation aspect where you can ask questions directly to, you know, all the people who built these great businesses, um, you can actually find most of the learning online. Like the University of YouTube is there for you if you are starting something up. And honestly, most of it is there. It's not a regurgitation in a sense because you don't get to have that classroom setting where you get to ask questions. Um, but I think and that's one of the great things about being the, the, the program. Uh, but if you were just looking for just the key learnings, um, you know, everything's actually online. So you can actually gather that from there. Not saying they're not useful, but, you know, go ahead, right? Go and search it up on YouTube. It's all there. So um, the, the, the um, yeah. combinator, the ultimately, they, 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 they um, invest in, in companies that are yeah. involved in it, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, not all companies get accepted. So you'll after you do the program, you will do the pitch, then they'll invest in you if everything goes well, but you could still screw it up, right? Like, so there's plenty of, I mean, startups, like 99% of startups, 90% of startups, they all die, right? Like, 
and most of them die in the first six months to 12 months. If they keep going on for like past six months, even three months, right, without any clear path, it's a bit of a zombie company by that time. They ideally die, but, you know, that's, that's probably not the best way to do it, right? One of the biggest things they teach you always is to make decisions and make decisions fast. And so it's always better to pivot faster rather than waiting, oh, I, this is going to prove itself. Uh, I'll just wait another two months, three months. Because then you just get stuck in that loop of like, it's going to pan out. It's going to pan out. It's going to pan out. And then when it doesn't, you're just, you know, a mountain of disappointment. So making decisions fast, I think, very, very important. And that's one of the key things that they teach you. I think the other big thing about YCOM is you get the community there. So there's forums online, there's obviously like Slack groups and all that, but you don't really get that as easily in a lot of the other, I think, um, accelerators because YCOM is just so widespread globally. Um, you know, you've got a lot of startups from South America, obviously APAC in uh, the US, North America, and in the Middle East as well, in the MENA region. So it's just so widespread that the community is so strong. Um, all you need to do is just ask for feedback on X, Y, and Z, and you get really, really good feedback from everyone. And it's not just from startups. It's actually from a lot from alumni as well. So that's actually really key because all the alumnus, uh, all of the alumni that have been through their startup journey, they know what to look out for. They know where you could potentially you know, hurt, fail, or have mistakes, and they help advise, right? And that's actually one of the key parts of their network. And they're growing it really, really well because they just yeah, they invest very aggressively in like these really early stage startups. So yeah, although you miss everything being in person, virtual sessions still have value, but the community actually is the biggest value out of all that. Oh, that's really good. That's really interesting, man. I think that's something that's not really touched on quite a lot because everyone mm. just looks at the prestige of it versus looking at mm. what the prestige brings is really the network then and the community along yep. with it. Um, but I mean, I just want to kind of, so I want to touch on the, on the funding for, for a bit, right? So you guys raised 3 million US, yep, uh, that's right. I think. Right, so can we can we can we just really some challenge some myths? Because I mean, you raise the money, you're in, sure. you're involved in that, you know what's going on, right? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. like you know, maybe you can tell us like so. I've got a few questions. So, like, um, do your do the co-founders do directors actually get any of that money? And like in terms of realistically, right? So maybe don't talk about discount. I don't want you guys to give yeah. me any sort of secrets of the business. But yeah, in your experience, right? How quickly? Can you like run through three million US dollars? Like, uh, because yeah. I, because as a as a early, because you guys are an early stage startup. You're not yeah. a you're yeah. not a you're not a very very big startup. So mm. early stage. Mm. How mm. quickly can you run through? Because I actually worked in a company that ran through three and a half million US dollars yeah. in less than twelve months, doing mm. really stupid things, amazingly <laughs> stupid things, and they were in one market, one yeah. market, dude, one market. <laughs> I think so. Just to, I guess, go into that, like it can last however long you need or however short you need. When you raise your money, and when you, when you raise three mil, you need to be very clear what you're going to be doing with that money to investors because they will ask you. That's literally what is the main question whenever you pitch to them. It's what are you going to do with three mil if we give you this much? And then you got to say this percentage is going to go towards marketing, this percentage is going to go towards this is going to go towards right and so that's where you have to be absolutely clear that that is your plan and how close you stick to that plan can vary because things happen right like the circumstances change um you know anything like could change in a matter of like you know months so i think the key thing after that is once you raise a three mil you have a plan it's you have to always consistently update your investors on a monthly basis in terms of your numbers, because you will have your traction and then you'll have sort of your, your, your chart. This is what we're going to achieve over the next 12 to 18 months. Three million could last you two years, three years even, or it could last you six months. It all really depends on your strategy and what you're pitching to your investors. They, do they want you to use three million in the six months to achieve as much, as much market share as possible because the macro scale of things like there are other competitors coming in or it's a very hot market, blah, blah, blah. Do you have first move advice? Is that how you're going to deploy your capital? Um, or do you want the three 
last like two years, our burn rate is going to be really low. We're going to be very lean um, because I can foresee that this will take time um, because people aren't ready yet, but it's okay, right? We're still getting good traction. It's just not going to be um, hockey stick, you know, growth. Mm -hmm. So it all depends on what you're pitching to your investors. They will definitely ask, and you have to be absolutely clear that of what your plan is. And on a monthly basis, updating them on the plan. If it changes, you have to keep absolutely transparently clear with them and not bullshit your investors. This is basically what happened with Theranos, right? I don't know if you keep in touch with all no, that yeah, yeah. The whole tech news. Um, you know, ultimately, always this concept of like, um, you know, fake it till you make it, right? Mm -hmm. And how much are you going to really fake it until you can make it to your investors? You can never make it to everyone. Right? You can you can fake it, right? You can try, right? Because ultimately you have to create your own markets out of nothing. Um, but you know, to your real investors, you can't really fake it. If you are delayed for a certain feature and it's delaying revenue or whatever it is, you have to be absolutely clear. And you have to be absolutely clear as well with a uh, strategy or with like how you're tackling it as a problem. Man, Theranos, uh, uh, Elizabeth Holmes faked it for about eight years. Around that <laughs> yeah, well, she was really good. She was like, she could, she should write a book on that. I think she will. Yeah, yeah. I After mean, she gets out of jail, there's a movie. Will. There's a movie being made out of it. Oh, so, for sure, for sure. Yeah, it's already it's starring Amanda Seyfried, I think it is. So yeah, like I oh, don't know. Okay. It's already there in the works. So make money, right? However you can. But that's essentially how you could still fake it till you make it, right? If you're not clear with your investors or if they just purely believe in what you say, but not the numbers. You can fake numbers as well. That's essentially what she did. She faked oh, yeah. like people signing up to, you know, um, oh, using... Man, dude I, I, dude, I work for a company that fake numbers all the time. Yeah. They yeah. try and, to put my name on it all the time. I was like, oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. So I, I guess back to that question, like uh, 3 million is a lot. It can really be as long or as short as you need. It's all about your strategy. How much of that's in cash? I mean, it's all cash, really. How much do directors get? Doesn't matter because it's depending on salaries and all that. Um, because what you ultimately do as a director or as like the one of the main shareholders, you want to value your shares. That's where the majority of your um, that's where the majority of your wealth creation will occur, right? Not your salary that you have on a monthly basis. That's there to keep you surviving so you can eat. Um, but then your thinking is like, um, you know, I'm going to start building my company. I need to focus on that. This cash is going to fuel that. It's not supposed to just go into my pockets for whatever reason, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I think it all depends on the strategy, how much you want to pay yourself. And after that, it's all about increasing your shareholder value by growing the business, so and the, your next raise. So then, when you're when you're raising, right? They're actually, sorry, this is a this is a slightly more technical yeah, sure, question. So sure, when you're sure. raising, right? I'm assuming that you guys are you guys are giving away you you guys are diluting relatively, right? So for yes. example, depending on percentage, you're diluting relatively, right? Yeah. Man, that that must oh. suck if you're a so if you're a minor share if you're a minor shareholder, you're an early stage yeah. employee. So mm -hmm. you've got say. Initially, out of 100%, you got 5% mm. because you're still early stage, comes in with a bunch. Mm. Suddenly, the valuation goes up. And they're like, hey, we're going to dilute you down to two and a half, mm. right? Because we want to raise funding, right? Yeah, that's okay. I mean, you're con but you constantly get diluted diluted further down because especially when, uh, the, when they, if they do a share, if they do a, a, a change in the share structure as well, mm you will get diluted even further or your percentage yeah. drops significantly. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, dilution is normal, right? Because yeah. you're always like creating new shares and thus diluting the existing or previous shares. But the value of the shares goes up in price as well because you're valued at a much higher valuation, right? So even though maybe at the start it would have been $1, your next round could have been $8 a share. That's an 8x growth for every share. Yeah, so, but that's that's... To me, right. So the the, the mm. thing is, I I get that part. Mm. I think where my concern lies is your exit is only upon either acquisition or IPO. Mm. If you're an early stage guy, yeah. Because okay. if you're a late stage guy, then yeah, then you, there's buyback, share buybacks. There's a bunch of different things you can do, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean but, that's true, right? Yeah. And I think that's not all. Like I mean, I a big myth is like everyone who raises a decent amount, they're always like IPO, IPO not always true sure you can get acquired and i think that ends up being quite valuable mm -hmm. it also depends on the stage of when you want to get acquired or when you ipo as well right um, i think most tech companies ipo now they do it really without achieving profitability 
because they do want to return that to employee. The funding cycle is generally between eight to ten years. Yeah. Um, you know, like you gotta you gotta make a business during that period of time. Uh, and there are three phases to it. It's very it, it's it's a tenuous process. Um, but that is, I mean, that's the normal way of doing it, right? If you were someone working for an early stage company, I think it's quite normal to get diluted. Your value per share goes up. The question would always ask your uh, founders, right? Or the founding team, team is like, what's going to be your vision of the company, uh, you know, uh, liquidating or having that liquidity event. Are you going to IPO? Are we going to SPAC? Are we going to like get acquired? Um, at the start, it's very uncomfortable clear because you don't know right like you could do any of these parts but once you get to your series b c onwards you got to really know because by that point you already have a flywheel for your business going it's already self-running it's sustainable for every dollar you put in you're getting two dollars back good right how do you keep scaling that if you're not at that stage i guess some of the choices are always just like we'll just ipo and dump our company to the public market where a certain green company did that recently and, you know, has gone down in, stock in price, unfortunately. Um, so, you know, it happens. Um, but that is one way as well to liquidate, right? So you don't also piss off all your employees and your existing shareholders. Uh, many ways in the cat to have and provide that um, the end game uh, for employees. But it really, I think, it's a big risk for a lot of people to come in early stage. Yeah. Um, so definitely no doubt about that. But the payoff can be quite big. But the payoff for most people, if you IPO, generally quite big. You're definitely like 20, 30, 40 xing like your shares, depending on what stage you came in at. True, true. No, that 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 I think the it's always the risk that you take if you're mm. an early stage guy, right? But um, mm. I don't know, man, because I I've seen I've seen way more failures than successes. Yeah. Than yeah. It or like you fail and the shares are worth zero. Yeah, way, <laughs> yeah. way more. Like, and they're like, oh, like they they did three rounds of funding. Yeah. And then the share price at the end of like when they basically they exited, I'm using that in in, in inverted commas, yeah. was like like a fraction of what it could have been. Yeah. Right. It's, it's, it's kind of really, disappointing. It's right. It's trusting your founders to do the right thing and the right thing for you. And if you if they don't have a solid, and that's why a track record is very important. But if they don't have that, I think that's very difficult. But that's also when you see the big big VCs come in, right? If you've got someone like Sequoia coming in, you've got SoftBank coming in, they're going to let it fail. You see, we were, we were could have been a complete shambles, could, could have been a zero-dollar company. But SoftBank comes in, they asked Adam Newman, and now they're basically saying, you know, we'll, we'll turn this around. Employ another CEO who has turned it around, they ipo Everyone's making money. Everyone's happy. The only loser here is actually SoftBank, um, mm-hmm. who has probably lost billions on this. Um, but ultimately, you can turn it around and still make it work. The value of everyone, um, instead of it making it go to zero. So the value of your uh, your directors, your founding team, very important. But also then your backers, right? Very very important because they can get you out of a out of a big mess. Yeah, no, that's true. I think there are a million more questions I want to ask the branch from this subject, but I'm, I'm mindful of, of your time, mm. John. So just to, before we wrap things up, sure. You know, we love to talk about talk to our guests about you know the books that have influenced their lives or, or books they they normally recommend to others. Do you, do you have like a top three top three that you love to share with with, yeah. the, with their audience? Yeah. So I do have a top three. Uh, Generally, not some of them are business books. So one of them I read recently is Changing World Order by Reed Dalio. So it goes in a little bit about like what's happening politically right now and all the different changes over time, right? Historically speaking. Sorry, John, so, could you could you repeat the name again, man? Sorry. Oh, sorry. sorry. Uh, Changing World Order by Ray Dalio. Got it. Okay. And yeah. so I think it's a very, I mean, it's an important book to read now as we see COVID accelerate and change things up. Um, second book I love and I've read it probably reread it again uh, is Meditations by Marcus Aurelius so mm. if you're a fan of Stoicism that's generally the go-to book easy to digest easy to learn from um, by Marcus Aurelius the mm. Roman yes, general it's good. yes it's, it's, a, it's quite a big one yeah it's good 
It's really good. Oh, I've never heard yeah. of it. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah, All right. It, it, it helps you focus, I think, for me as well, and also of things like the noise, right? Um, in in life, because it helps you focus on yourself and what you can do to really impact the world, and it, it gives you a lot of good perspective, I think. Um, and the last book I'd say, and this is a more macroeconomics kind of um, play uh, book, is Why Nation uh, by Darren Ajimolu. Sorry, could you say the name again? Sorry, you got why Why nations fail. Nations. You're the first person I've met who's also read that book. That that is a it's a it's a brilliant book. I uh, listened book. to the audio version of it. Yeah, yeah, cool. yeah. And it really gives you a really good macroeconomic view of like you know what has happened before and again what could potentially happen in the future. Uh, so many things, right? And tech has such a good twenty element to all of it. Um, you know, one thing they haven't written it because it's being written now is really the impact of tech, right? Um, and politically speaking, how everything is going to change even with it. You see the CCP cracking down on like all the big tech companies in China, for example, um, how Facebook's going to the metaverse, da, da, da. how is it going to change all the, the world, creator economy, web 3.0, all of this is being written right now, right? But why nations fail gives you that sort of like nice historical view. And are we bound to repeat like, the same things? I don't know, except in a, in a, in the metaverse. Who knows? <laughs> so yeah, like those are probably my top three books that I would recommend people to read. Nice, man. Those are actually really interesting um, recommendations. I don't think we've ever got any of these before. Usually there's a couple of overlaps from uh, because we have so many guests. Oh, yeah. I don't right. think we've ever had this before. Nice. No. I'm going to read Meditations. Yeah. Principles is really good. Uh, yeah, I'm going to try New yes. World Orders. Yeah, Principles by Ray Dalio is, is a good one. Yeah. Changing, changing world, world order, changing world order. New, new world not order. new world order, man. The rap group. <laughs> oh, new world, yeah, changing world order. My bad. Uh, the NWO is a different organization, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> um. So, hey, man. So, I've got one last question, uh, John, and then we'll let you go. But, um, if you could actually look back, right, at some of the um, top, like the top lessons, business, life, whatever mm. it is, right, you learn over the years. What are one or two of them that's really stuck by you for the last uh, for for the last few uh, your whole life basically? Yeah, uh, I have to also run really quickly, but I'll be very quick with this. Two main important things I think is just execute. So whatever it is that you're doing, um, it doesn't matter, right? You can overplan. You can overplan kills ideas. You can overplan. Just execute. Just do it, right? Like get a web page up, get something up, list your items up. I don't care. Just execute. Um, if you don't execute, it doesn't matter. Um, and the last one is work, work with grit. So put up with the grit, put up with like any difficulties that you encounter, but also know when to quit. So it's a balancing act, right? Like you got to get through, um, or you got to be gritty enough to really push through a lot of like shitty things because nothing is going to work and pan out um, or according to plan. Um, if it does, then something's wrong. Um, but you also got to know whenever you start something up, you know, three, six months, whatever it is your timeline is, set a timeline and know when to quit it if it isn't working out. So those, I think, are the two major, like, lessons. So business lessons, I think. Keep executing. Don't overplan. Get through the grit. Don't know when to quit. That's all. Well, they rhymed. I didn't realize. Yeah, yeah, you, you planned that, man. You planned it. You turned it. <laughs> you humble brag. Oh, it rhymed. Oh, oh no, I didn't know this. What? I did. I wrote it all. <laughs> Uh, I, everything was absolutely <laughs> uh, hey, John so I know you gotta run Dave why don't you take us out man because I think um, John's gotta run before that the Deskimo so so if you didn't oh, yeah. hear it John is a um, part of Deskimo check it out we have on our show notes but check out their office spaces the fantastic Deskimo.me and so for our listeners today John and Deskimo are offering an uh, eight dollars off the first day using the code drinks eight and that's the number eight but we'll put more details in the show notes at business over drinks doc. um so you guys uh, have you mainly have uh, co-working spaces in in southeast asia right yep that's right singapore hong kong and indonesia right now expanding to other countries soon okay so keep in touch with that so uh, we'll more information on showing us, but once again, it was just a fantastic talk, John. You you obviously know what you you're doing, and what you're talking about. It was it was really good um, cool. intellectual discussion. Um, 
for everyone else, thank you so much for, for listening and watching. Don't forget to follow us on all, all social media platforms, Instagram, YouTube, LinkedIn, Facebook, website, TikTok now. Search business over drinks. Um, like, subscribe. It really goes a long way. It brings in guests like John. So thank you, everyone. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. Thanks, John. Hey, everyone. We really hope you enjoy the episode. But before you go, don't do it. Please don't leave me. We, because we have a really important announcement. The world is ending. The zombies are going to take over. The vaccine that you've all heard about is actually a killer zombie vaccine. And if you've seen iRobot, if you've seen World War Z, World War Z, Z, whatever it's called, it's going to happen. But all seriousness. QAnon, so- QAnon. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. QAnon? Yeah. In all seriousness, in serious, ugh, I'm stuttering. But anyway, in all seriousness, though, Liquor Loot. So Liquor Loot is an amazing company. So we're really happy to have them on board. They house alcohol subscription services, Whiskey Loot and Gin Loot. And they deliver three premium and hand selected whiskey and gin tasters from around the world each month. So guys, this isn't just your standard, you know, hey, subscription business model where you just get three uh, tasters and that's it. They're actually a platform for you to discover new gins and whiskeys, which is what I just did with my classic dry. It's really cool. The twist of lemon in there. And I've been drinking pretty much since 1 p.m. Yeah, it's it's, it's 100% true and, and drink responsibly. But anyway. Right. So, <laughs> um, so like zombie we would, virus, we wouldn't be a, we wouldn't be a podcast with our listeners and we wouldn't have sponsors with our listeners. So our listeners get a special offer on whiskey at whisk from whiskey loot. So just head over to our website, businessoverdrinks.com and head over to our sponsorship page or even our show notes page where we'll actually put a link to liquor loot. Just click on that link and then check it out. You'll be able to get a, you'll be able to chance to get a, a taste of a curated selection of hard fine scotches, single malts, and new world whiskeys, including Japanese and American ones. I actually, they're all award winning. Most of them are award winning, actually. So it's kind of cool. Uh, I prefer the Japanese ones personally because I think they do better whiskey than the Americans. So here we go. Uh, head over to businessoverdrinks.com, click on a sponsorship section, and look out for Liquor Loot. And remember, everyone, Drink responsibly, don't be like tongue, and do not sue us at whatsoever. Yeah, please don't sue us. Be responsible. Also, all right, you're just gonna be stuck in your head for the rest of the day, guys. <laughs> Listen, <laughs> all right.